Hello, and welcome to the Corona Ready Cleaning Course, where you'll learn the right way to protect yourself and your customers from the coronavirus. I'm your host, Melissa Homer, MadePro's Chief Cleaning Officer. First, you have to be asking yourself, who is this lady? Why listen to me? Well, as I mentioned before, my name is Melissa Homer, and I'm MadePro's Chief Cleaning Officer, which means I'm our subject matter expert on all things cleaning. I've been in the commercial chemical and cleaning industry with professional cleaners for over 20 years and I work regularly with top scientists and engineers in the commercial chemical and equipment industry. Usually I like to be behind the scenes, building training materials, testing products, but today I'm coming to you myself, and I openly admit, I'm not a YouTube celebrity, this is not my comfort zone, and I usually hire voice actresses to do this work. But I knew this training needed to be done now, and it needed to be done fast, so I'm here today to do it for you. You'll have to deal with what you got, I apologize, uh, but the knowledge is there. So there'll be some likes, there'll be some ums, but stay with me because it's important. I am featured regularly as a feature columnist in articles such as Taste of Home, Real Simple, HGTV, um, and more for my cleaning knowledge. I'm being very honest with everyone today, I am not a chemist and I'm not a doctor, but I am an expert cleaner and an expert in the cleaning industry so I'm here for what I can bring you today, which is how you can properly clean in this new environment and make sure your customers stay safe and you stay safe. So you may be thinking to yourself, why am I putting this training out in public? Shouldn't this just be for our made pro employees? Well, quite frankly, it's because I realized as I was building this training for our staff that over 70% of the professional cleaning industry is still independent self-employed cleaners who get virtually no formal training. And I went to my boss and said, hey, I'm building this training for our Made Pro franchise, but I'm scared for the rest of the community who doesn't have the proper training. And we talked it out and he agreed that we had to do this for the public, that this is our way to give back. Um, so if you are a independent cleaner or work for a small cleaning company, we're inviting you, please use this training because you need it today. Things are happening right now, and if you have been sloppy in the world of um, training your staff regarding disinfection and managing their own protection, it is time to learn the right way to do things. So please um, take this as a formal invitation. It's free, it's yours, enjoy. Um, and hopefully it helps everybody out. The main reason I want to help everybody out and the reason I think you should become a Corona Ready Cleaner is because we can be part of the solution. We're the unsung heroes in this story. Professional cleaners are frankly the atlas holding up our planet that no one appreciates. We are the reason that the community at large is able to live with so little illness as it is already. And Corona is just another virus for us to bat do battle with and to win. So if we do our job right, we're gonna not only protect ourselves, but help protect our consumers making there be less germs for them to interact with in their space and in their home, um, less chance to spread germs within the family, and a chance of really making a lasting impact against the infectious disease like the new COVID-19 coronavirus. So today's agenda is going to be coronavirus 101. What is it? Can we kill it? What's involved? Then we're going to go into a big lesson on how to protect both ourselves and our customers. Again, I believe we're gonna be the unsung heroes in this story, and I believe we can go out there and make a difference for our consumers' lives and really help them uh, weather this storm. So let's get cracking. First, let's do Corona 101. I'm gonna be blunt. Go check out the CDC. This is not a Corona class. Um, if you're looking for best advice on the disease itself and how it's spreading and all of that stuff, just Google, okay? So we're gonna give you the crash course basics for right now so we can spend our time together focusing on what you came here for, which is the cleaning, okay? So the fundamentals I'm gonna give you is the real name for it is COVID-19. The coronavirus is a type of virus, there's lots of them, and it's been around for a long time, but this is a new novel strain, which means nobody has had it, which means nobody's immune to it, which means there's no vaccine for it, which means it's passing like, wildfire, so we've got to manage it. Um, it gives you respiratory illness, and for 
Right now, there's no known treatment, and for about 16% of patients, it can get pretty serious, even all the way up to deadly, which is why we need to be armed and ready to do battle and fight this virus back uh, before it gets too out of hand. So how does it spread? Simple. The most obvious and clear way that we know it uh, is passed between people is through close contact, um, six feet away or closer. But it also can be passed by poor management of coughing and sneezing into one's hands and spreading germs everywhere, and then touching other surfaces and making them all germy. Um, forgive the technical term. As well as people touching their eyes and their face, which inevitably takes those germs that they've gotten off of surfaces and puts them into their bodies. How can it be killed? Good news is, according to the CDC, it appears that most common hospital grade disinfectants are effective. So those are the ones we should be using right now, which hopefully most professional cleaners will already have in their arsenal. How we can help. Three simple rules. Stay healthy ourselves, kill those germs, and don't let the germs spread. How are we going to protect ourselves? That's focus number one, because obviously our main goal is to help our clients, but we can't do that if we're homesick ourselves. So A number one is how do we protect ourselves? Personal Protection 101. The way that we protect ourselves falls into two main buckets, which is basic hand hygiene, hand washing or sanitizing, or actual barrier protection, which in the form of disposable gloves. There's really pretty much it other than don't go in the house, um, which we need to do if we're gonna fight those germs for the community. The fundamentals of hand hygiene are that gloves are great. They keep germs out, awesome. But the real problem is they're not helpful foolproof. If you take them off wrong or if they rip while you're working, you're in trouble. So that's where hand hygiene comes in. Hand washing always works the best. It takes off all the germs, but it can leave germs behind if you don't do it right. I'm looking at you, Miss Six Cents Second Washers. Um, full 20 seconds here. And lastly, there's hand sanitizer, which does kill germs, but leaves them behind if your hands are dirty or use it incorrectly. This is one of the biggest misconceptions, both with our consumers and fellow professional cleaners. When something says, oh, it's a sanitizer, it sounds more exciting. But the reality is, if it's used on dirty hands, it's less effective than washing your hands. It, no, it sounds exciting, but the, always the tried and true gold standard is to wash those hands and then put your gloves on to create yet another further layer of barrier. So again, back to that hand hygiene hierarchy, always wear your gloves. It's always easiest to get germs off when you don't have, on them, don't have many on there in the first place. If there's less glove germs on there to start with, it's easier to wash off. Always wash your hands because as I said, that's the most effective way to remove as many germs as possible. And finally, if hand washing is not an option, hand sanitizer is absolutely a godsend when soap and water is not at play. So right now, we're gonna prompt the hand washing technique video from WHO um, so that you guys can see right from the source how to wash your hands properly the full 20 seconds. Hand washing should take you about one minute. Use a timer or count from one to ten in each of the following steps. Wet hands with water and apply enough soap to cover all surfaces of the hands. Let the water run smoothly to avoid touching the tap later on. Rub hands palm to palm to obtain a good quantity of foam. Then rub right palm over the back of left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub again palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked, repeating this action for each hand. Rub rotationally left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. To clean the tips of the fingers, rub rotationally backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. Rinse hands thoroughly with running water. Dry hands thoroughly with a single-use towel. 
If the tap is not elbow operated, use this towel to turn off the tap without touching it directly. Your hands are now clean and safe. Next, we're going to watch a proper glove wearing video. What I want you to particularly take away from this video is the importance of how you grip the gloves and the importance of hand hygiene both before and after putting on and off your gloves. Sam performs hand hygiene and then puts on her gloves. Sam knows the outside of her gloves are contaminated. Using her gloved hand, she grasps the palm area of her other gloved hand and peels off the first glove, holding the removed glove in the gloved hand. She slides her fingers of her ungloved hand under the remaining glove at her wrist and peels off the second glove over the first glove. She discards the gloves in a waste container. Sam performs hand hygiene. That's more like it, Sam. Just to reinforce what you've seen in both of those videos, hand washing needs to be at least a full 20 seconds. Find your favorite song. It's all over Twitter right now. I don't care if it's Staying Alive from the Bee Gees or Raspberry Beret, but wash the full 20 seconds. And remember, use that paper towel to exit the, uh, turn off the faucet and leave so you're not picking up somebody else's bad six second washing job. And in terms of the proper glove wearing, the key that you may not have picked up there is it's all about not touching your gloves with dirty hands first, so you're putting dirty gloves, hands in the gloves, and touching the outside of the glove with already dirty infected hands. And when you are pulling them on and off, you're always grabbing at the wrist, not at the hands where it's most likely going to be dirty. And when you're removing those gloves, you are pinching the glove as opposed to sticking your finger under it for the first one, so you're not taking that dirty gloved hand and shoving it all over your wrist and palm. You pull it off, and then with the clean hand, slide under the other hand to pull, peel, and contain them together. If you can master that, then your gloves are actually doing something for you. But here's another way that you may not be doing something for you, and this is where I see a lot of professional cleaners could use a lot of refresh, which is, the touching the eyes, nose, and face problem. Gloves are awesome, but they do nothing for you if you take those gloved hands and then start rubbing your eyes and scratching your nose and eating a snack and while you're at the clean with your gloved hands on that hasn't been washed. So you need to learn to protect your eyes, nose, and face. That looks like coughing properly into one's elbow as opposed to one's hand, which you're trying to keep clean, for both the consumer's sake and for ourselves. It also looks like not touching your eyes. It also looks like remembering that when you're cleaning, you need to learn the joy of the forearm. Your forearm can wipe a sweaty brow. Your forearm can push up your glasses. Your forearm can do lots of things, and it tends to be much less germy than your actual hands. Um, if you are a frequent eye toucher, I recommend wearing safety glasses or goggles during this time frame, not because it's going to help you protect from a virus, but because it's going to act as a physical barrier to remind you, oops, I'm touching my eye, oops, I'm touching my eye. But once they told me, don't touch my eyes. So that will help you remember and hopefully retrain the behaviors. Um, again, this is something we should have been doing it anyway. No one wants to pick up customers, colds or flu or toddler germs. This is just doubling down what we should have been doing it everywhere anyway. So don't let this scare you. This is typical protection for house cleaners always. It's just we have to make sure we're doing it right now because something even more concerning than usual is available to get in our bodies and we want to keep it out. Now everyone's going to ask me, what about masks? Let's be honest. You can't get them anyway, so stop stressing about it. But even if you could, it's a pointless activity at the moment. Well, about that. So we've got a critical update, which is, in case you've been living under a rock, the CDC has changed its direction from originally stating that masks were not necessary to they are now an incredibly important part of fighting this disease. 
So we now have to change our question from not just what about masks to what changed about masks? Now you may be thinking, ah, oh, the CDC got it wrong. But actually, they didn't get it wrong. They changed their perspective, which is a, such an important thing to do when you're studying anything. When they first looked at the issue of containing this disease, they thought about masks as we've always thought about them, as personal protective equipment, PPE, which is all about protecting yourself. And they knew at the time that there was a shortage of the style of masks necessary to filter out tiny virus particles. And so they said, well, gee, don't bother. The masks you could get a hold of are not going to be filtering enough to protect you. So it's not going to work. But then they changed their perspective. And they thought about instead of, oh, I'm just going to protect myself, can we all protect each other? And they shifted the idea from PPE, personal protective equipment, to CPE, community protective equipment. Can I wear this mask to protect you and you wear this mask to protect me? And when they changed their perspective, it changed everything because it turns out the requirements for a mask that can keep your germs in are far simpler than a mask that can filter out micro droplets from far away. It turns out any old mask, fabric mask, disposable mask, whatever you can get a hold of, will actually do a pretty darn good job keeping your germs to yourself. And if everyone's wearing one, there's far less in the air for you to breathe in and make you sick. So that perspective change from PPE to CPE is what really changed. And the change is beautiful. It's selfless. And it's really cool science. So speaking of beautiful, let's check out our pros in their new community protective equipment, made appropriated, of course, um, allowing you to see that showing the world that you care about them and your customers that you care about their health can really look quite stylish. Who knew? Protecting others is beautiful. And it's as simple as your face mask, disposable gloves, safety glasses, protective booties. Um, these are all going to keep you either from breathing out germs you shouldn't into the community or picking up germs you shouldn't onto yourself. And the safety glasses are, again, just to keep you from bonking your eye. Easy, right? So now that we know how stylish and effective masks can be, let's talk about how we take care of them. Let's talk about mask maintenance and ask ourselves the question, what are the rules for masks? And the rule is simple. Think of your mask like you would any other article of clothing that you wear close to your skin. Whether it's gym socks or a t-shirt you wore out gardening or any other sort of undergarment, the rules are exactly the same. You'd never wear stinky old sweaty socks from yesterday because you haven't had a chance to wash them yet. You'd never run around in a dirty shirt you wore gardening covered in dirt and germs because well, I'm supposed to wear it all day. It doesn't matter if it looks gross. You know better. Same rules with your masks. And the rules are simple. Wear a fresh mask every day. At the end of the day, wash it. If it gets something disgusting splashed on it, take it off and put on a fresh one. If it gets all holed and torn and otherwise disfigured, it's time to toss it and get a new one. Think of it like you would any pair of underwear or socks or t-shirt or any other clothing you wore close to your skin, and you know what to do already. Easy, right? Now let's talk about how to wear the mask properly. To wear the mask properly, I'm going to have to show you by wearing one, so forgive me if it muffles my sound a little bit. The top mask mistakes are, when you put your mask on properly, it just sits along your nose, along your cheeks, along your chin, right? Well, the top mis mistakes are you let your chin pop out because it's too small for you, or you've got your nose popping out because you think it makes it easier to breathe, even though, though now all the germs are shooting over from your nose. You got it so tight that you can't talk, or so loose, all the air is flowing up the nose sides and out the sides and out the bottom and not actually getting filtered through the cloth like it's supposed to be. 
or you got it on right, but then you're touching it all day long, touching that dirty house full of germs and getting it all over your mask. Or worst of all, you're constantly taking it off, defeating the purpose of it. The right way to wear a mask is tight enough that it's making a seal all around your face as much as possible. You want the air to go through the mask, not up and around. And you want to wash your hands every time you touch the mask, either with Purell or some other sanitizer or soap and water. Because again, if you've been touching your dirty house and then touching your face, you'd have no idea what's on there. Easy, right? Which now brings us to the question of, what about those filtering masks, those KN95s or N95 masks? The reality is right now there's still a nationwide shortage that's probably not going away for a while. But since I want this update to last, I'm gonna to talk to you about them now in case you are able to track some down in the future. N95s or KN95s, uh, KN95 is the Chinese standard, N95 is the US standard, are a type of filtering mask that actually can filter down fine enough particles to stop viruses. But most people, particularly most house cleaners, have never been properly fit test for these type of respirators. A fit test is when you put this mask on and make sure it has a perfect seal around your face and they put a big old hood on you and spray all sorts of stuff in there that you try to breathe in for like half an hour to see if it sneaks in anywhere, if you can smell anything and taste any bitterness in the, in the special spray. It's a whole thing, okay? And if you have not gone through that process, that means you have no idea if your KN or N95 mask fit you well enough to actually filter out everything. So if you track down some of these masks, they can provide you some additional protection in terms of the germs that are in the air. They can filter them better, but you cannot rely on them the way a healthcare worker does to break that six foot social distancing. You must maintain social distancing even if you track down one of these masks because you have not been properly fit test to ensure the proper full seal all around the nose, sides, edges, et cetera. But again, if you get a hold of them, they're great. But we have to conserve them because again, they are of limited supply and we wanna make sure as many as possible are going to healthcare workers and we're getting the non-sterile packaged extras that still should be, again, conserved until there's a chance for the manufacturing community to catch up to the need. So what does that conservation look like? Let's talk about the KN95 rotation plan. If you happen to track down some of these masks, you're gonna need a minimum of at least three. And you're also gonna need three cloth masks to put over them to protect them. So once you track down those masks, that's gonna be three sets. Set A, set B, set C. In each set, there'll be a cloth mask, a KN95 mask, and a plain old brown paper bag. And take an old Sharpie and just mark them all up so you know which one's which. Easy, right, so far? Cool. Each day at work, you're gonna to wanna to put on that KN95 first and smooth it over your nose, make sure you get as tight a seal in your face as you can. And you're gonna put your fabric mask over the KN95 mask to protect it from soils in the air and soils on you know, the surfaces that you might accidentally touch your face. So that fabric mask is going to protect your KN95 mask and help you keep it longer. Easy, right? Wear it all day, just like you would the normal fabric mask. Anytime you touch it, again, you're still gonna need to sanitize your hands or wash them. At the end of the day, what you're going to do is you're going to take them aside and the fabric mask, you're gonna wash it. Hand wash it, washer dryer, whatever you get a hold of, launder it. The KN95 cannot be washed. And whatever YouTube tells you, don't try sanitizing in the microwave in case you enjoy fire. Um, so don't do it. It can't be properly cleaned unless you have a special factory to do so and you're not a factory. So your only option is to let it dry out. You're going to take that K95 and plop it in an open brown paper bag. That's it. Just let it sit there. It's going to air dry in around 24 hours. The germs that are on the mask should die, but we're going to let it sit there for several days just to be sure because COVID-19 uh, 19 does last 24 hours on poor surfaces like cardboard and stuff, but we want to give it an extra couple of days because, you know, let's not mess around. The next day at work, you're going to wear set B. Again, can 95 first, fabric over it, wear it for the day, wash your hands when you touch it. At the end of the day, just like last time, we're going to take the can 95 
plop it in our brown paper bag to store, and the fabric mask we're gonna wash. Do the same thing for day C. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday now, right? By Thursday, that set from Monday has been airing out for several days, it's good and dry, everything's on it, it's good and dead, and the fabric mask, if we hand washed it, has long since hung dry, and everything is ready to be used again. And so we can start all over. How long you can keep that KN95 mask is totally up to usage. Uh, if something nasty splashes on your face, you may not be able to use it past that first day. Um, if it gets torn or worn or crumpled and it's no longer making a good seal on your face or it gets uh, smelly or soiled inside, really nasty, time to go. Please don't wear a dirty mask. Even if you're like, oh, this is KN95, it's special. It's not that special. It's not worth an upper respiratory infection, okay? So as soon as it looks icky or smells icky, it's time to go. Um, but you should be able to get anywhere from five to eight wears out of it if you're being careful. And just when that eighth wear is done, get a new one and throw it in the rotation. So that's it. Just remember, take care of your mask and I'll take care of you. Let's talk about the ideal entry and exit hand hygiene routine for residential cleaners. I know this is what you came here for. Here's the proper order you should be using to put on your gloves, wash, use hand hygiene, enter and exit the home so that you are reducing your likelihood of getting infected as little as possible so that you continue to stay healthy and help your customers. So here it goes. And I'm gonna move myself out of the way here so you can see. And the deal is this. Step one, you're gonna wash hands before you leave for work. As you learned in your previous slide, hand sanitizers do not work well on dirty hands. Your body oils and soils on your hands consume that alcohol and keep it from working. So clean hands are the only thing that work well with hand sanitizer. So when you get home, the best thing you can do for yourself is right before you leave for work, give your hands a good scrubbing. Cool. When you drive up to the customer's house, you wanna have that hand sanitizer waiting for you in your cleaning caddy. Before you go into the property, pull out your sanitizer, give yourself one last good go over so you're sure your, gloved, your ungloved hands are nice and clean. Grab your gloves from whatever box you keep them in, put them on properly, thank you, and head on into that property to go fight those germs and help your client out. Go in the home, you're gonna learn, how to, in the rest of this class, we'll talk about where to clean, but you're gonna focus on all those high touch points, like appliances, and by the way, that front doorknob you need to leave out of, make sure everything's clean and properly disinfected. That brings us, by the way, to step three here. Then we're going to remove our gloves. Properly, thank you, what we talked about from the palm and underneath and immediately wash our hands properly in the customer's sink. This is at the very end of the clean, hopefully when we're all packed up and ready to go. After we've taken off our gloves and washed our hands properly, we're gonna scoop up the last of our stuff and head on out. When we get to our car before we enter, we're gonna grab our hand sanitizer and one last time go over our hands because if there's any germs in the property that through our disinfection we happen to miss, we wanna make sure we're not taking those with us to the next client. So we wanna do that before we touch the car and get the car all uh, infected. So again, if we're gonna walk through the steps one last time, it's wash your hands, bring your hand sanitizer with you. Sanitize in the car, put your gloves on. Go inside, clean like you mean it. Remove your gloves properly and wash your hands in the sink. Go outside, give yourself one last splash of sanitizer, open the door and away you go. And you will again have done everything according to the CDC that you can do to properly protect yourself against any infectious disease. Now let's get to the most important part, the part where we get to play the hero in our community, which is how we can protect our customers. Let's first talk about cleaning and disinfection 101. What most people don't realize is there's a broad range between cleaning and disinfection in terms of what you're doing to reduce germs in an, in an environment. When you clean, if you just use soap and water, which classically you know, has basic surfactants and degreasers in it, 
you are removing dirt and soil from the surface and washing it away. That act of removing the dirt and soil actually takes away a good solid 97% of germs. It's really good job. Uh, hygiene is important. It's why we clean in the first place. When you introduce chemical disinfectants and sanitizers into the mix, you can now reduce that number of germs even further. Sanitizing removes 99.9% .9 of germs, which sounds really awesome, right? Except if you know about disinfection, which is where you can remove 99.999% of germs. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, 97% sounded awesome. Who cares about that extra almost 3%? You do if you want to help your customers stay healthy. And I'm going to show you why. Sanitizing reduces your exposure to germs 1,000%. When you're at that 99.9, it's a 1,000% reduction of your exposure to germs. Awesome, right? except when you wait till you see disinfecting. It reduces your exposure a hundred thousand fold. Yes, that's right. Thousand percent reduction versus a hundred thousand percent reduction in exposure to germs. And when it's something new like Corona where your body does not have an immunity, I want that a hundred thousand percent reduction in exposure. So that means you need to properly disinfect, not just sanitize. And if you've been kind of sloppy about how you're doing it, time to get back on track. Um, hopefully all professional cleaners know how to properly disinfect, but if you have forgotten the real rules, that's what the rest of this course is about. There are four basic types of disinfectants available to you as a professional cleaner. There are oxidizing agents like bleach. There are balonics, which is something like a Lysol spray. There are quaternary ammonium compounds, which is uh, in a lot of popular products like this Spick and Span all-purpose spray and press glass cleaner that we use that's a hospital grade disinfectant. And acidity, which is like lemon juice or citric acid, uh, common in a lot of bathroom cleaning products that are uh, disinfectants, like a common disinfecting bathroom that we use. The key here on how they all work is that oxidizers like bleaches and peroxides actually destroy the cell walls by uh, stealing electrons. Uh, it's kind of neat. It kind of like pulls them apart. Um, Philonics actu actually coagulate proteins. Think of like a scab where everything's like sort of coagulated together. It, it kills them very good. <laughs> um, and uh, thus is one of the more effective um, disinfectants against some pretty hardcore stuff. Um, quaternary uh, ammonium compounds actually denature proteins and unravel them. Um, and make the whole cell membrane leak and fall apart. Um, again, very dead germs. Um, and finally, acidity just dissolves the suckers, which is kind of awesome. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, each type of disinfectant does work, but they come with their own pros and cons. For oxidizers, like bleaches and peroxides, they kill a whole variety of germs, which is great, but they're super unstable and they do a lot of surface damage. When you open a bottle of bleach, it actually goes bad after a certain amount of months. Uh, hydrogen peroxide reacts and uh, become, goes bad even faster. And when it doesn't work, it's no longer disinfecting. Um, and as we all know, bleach does a lot of staining and corrosion and damage to surfaces. So using it all the time isn't great. But when you need it, you need it. Quads do no surface damage. They're awesome. Um, they're actually one of the best choices, I think, for professional cleaners because it means we can use them everywhere in the client's home without damaging stuff. The challenge is that they lose power if there's dirt on the surface, which there shouldn't be because we're professional cleaners and we know what we're doing. So quads is a great choice for professional cleaners, but maybe more risky for a uh, consumer or independent that um, isn't well-trained and may not clean properly. The privilege to use quads comes with the, um, knowing how to properly clean and get dirt off the surface. Um, Philonics, as I mentioned before, they kill a wide, rate of wide range of stuff, even some the most difficult stuff, but they're so powerful, they're risky to us as consumers and cleaners to breathe and to eat off the surfaces, etc. They're very dangerous. So they're great for germ kill, bad for us, so you only want to really use them in a healthcare setting where you absolutely have to. You know, if you're fighting C. diff and you're trying to manage it going through the, pro, um, the healthcare facility, you're gonna whip out some philonics, but otherwise it's not a great choice. Um, but again, we're grateful to it existing in the healthcare industry where we need it most.
Um, and finally, acids. The good news is they're simple and they work. Uh, the bad news is, again, just like the oxidizers, they also come with some surface damage um, and some safety concerns because, well, no one enjoys getting burned by acid. So we're going to pick our poison here. Um, and again, depending on how they're used in each product, you're always going to read the manufacturer's labels, but this is the basics of how they work. So the underlying theme for all of these products, though, is you got to clean before you disinfect. This is the number one mistake of independent cleaners and consumers cleaning at home. They say, oh, look, I've got this magical disinfectant. I'm just going to spray it over some dirty counter and walk away. And look, mom, no more germs. I'm safe from coronavirus. Lies, okay? You must remove the dirt. Why? The dirt consumes the disinfectant, and it shields the germs on the surface from contact with the disinfectant. And all the germs that didn't get killed can now feed on the remaining dirt and stay alive longer. Um, can't underline this enough. If you want germs gone, got to clean first and then disinfect what's left. Got it? Good. All right. The other big rule is disinfection takes time. One of the biggest things that drives me bonkers, and I see professional cleaners all over the country, all across companies doing it, they go, oh, look, I've got this super powerful disinfectant. I'll just spray it and wipe it dry and I'm good to go. No, you're not. All those chemical reactions I described earlier, that coagulating of proteins and unraveling of, of, of proteins and breaking down of cell walls, takes several minutes to occur. If you just spray and wipe, the bottle of disinfectant you're using is no more effective than soap, period. I don't care how sexy the bottle is. I don't care how exciting it sounds. If you just sprayed and wiped it dry, it is doing nothing more than soap for you. To sanitize the surface, to kill that 99.9% .9 of germs, for most standard products, takes around five minutes. Again, always read the labels because your product may be different, but most products, it's five minutes. To disinfect, takes a full 10 minutes soak. If you're not waiting the 10 minutes, if the surface isn't staying wet 10 minutes, you've annoyed the germs, you haven't killed them. And again, I don't care how fancy the product sounds, these are the rules. Now, there are some hardcore products that will pr promise a shorter time to disinfection, but every one of those requires an additional rinse step afterwards to get them off, because if they're that high a concentrate that they can kill in less than 10 minutes, you have no business touching, eating off of, or using that surface uh, soiled with that disinfectant afterwards. It's going to get you sick and your customer sick. So those fast acting ones always require a full rinse step afterwards. So frankly, they're slower than um, using the proper normal ones that take five to 10 minutes. Those fast acting ones were designed for healthcare, where someone needs to do things like turn over a surgery room or an ER. They're not meant for house cleaning where we want to make sure our consumers are safe and healthy to be able to cook their dinner after we've cleaned. Um, so make sure you're using the right products that are safe enough to be used to disinfect and to have a little bit remain on the surface and not be a risk to the consumer. And when it works right, the germs disappear. Isn't that fun? Gotta love graphics. All right. For my Made Pro Pros, are, luckily for us, we're good to go. Uh, all the products we use, We've been doing this a long time and we knew what we were doing to begin with because, well, I picked them and I care about disinfection. I'm a bit of a germaphobe, so I was already planning for this. Um, all of your products, your all-purpose cleaner, your bathroom cleaner, are hospital-grade disinfectants and they kill a wide variety of germs. So you've been protecting your customers for years. Um, you just need to make sure if you've gotten even a little bit complacent, we train you fully and thoroughly in our Made Pro University on how to use these products for the full 10 minutes. But if you've gotten a little um, complacent, this is time to stop being complacent and use them right. For our customers, if you're watching this, or independents, the answer is good old household bleach or alcohol, because that's what you're going to have easiest access to. The deal is, according to CDC, 30 cup of bleach per gallon of water or 70% concentration alcohol is fair game for disinfection. But let's be clear here. Both of these products must be used with a clean surface. You must clean first. You cannot just glug bleach into your all-purpose cleaner and call it a day. You're going to need to wash down that surface with an all-purpose cleaner, then take your bleach and water mix and apply that to the surface and let it air dry. 
Same thing with um, our Spick and Span and Comet products. It works the same drill, but we just get one less step because it's designed to be used as a one-step disinfectant, which means we can clean that surface down with that Spick and Span and that Comet and just leave it damp. If you leave your surface nice and wet and damp, it will dry in 10 minutes, which gives you that germ kill. You don't have to come back and do extra work. A lot of people are scared of, oh, I can't really disinfect my customer's homes. It's gonna take too long. No, it's not. You just need to know to leave more soap on the counter. That's really the difference here. Clean like you always been doing, but just leave things good and wet before you go. Now, I didn't say sopping. I don't want puddles on every customer's counter from across America, but damp. Long enough that it takes 10 minutes to dry. If you're concerned you're not leaving it damp enough, go experiment on your own counter tonight. Put some on and set a timer for yourself. Come back in like eight minutes. Does it still look kind of damp? Feel it. Does it still feel kind of damp? If it's bone dry, you're not leaving enough water behind. If it's still kind of damp, good job, you did it. Learn how wet is wet enough for your territory. Um, if you're in a hotter climate, you may need to leave it a little wetter. Um, the key there, though, again, is 10 minutes, period, end of story, for most disinfections. Now the question, of course, is, well, what do I disinfect? Let's be honest. Residential environments are not laboratories. We cannot steam blast all the walls, ceiling, floor, and bookcases and every little book inside. And we don't need to. Because good news for us is the coronavirus appears to live anywhere from hours to days, depending on the surface. But it's not like it's going to be all over every little thing. Uh, most poor surfaces and things like that, um, soft surfaces, it actually is going to less, live less time on. So what we're really worried about is the high touch surfaces. Hopefully our consumers are doing their job. By the way, consumers, if you're watching this, wash your fl flipping hands the full 20 seconds all the time. When you get home from work, wash your hands. When your kids get home from school, help them wash their hands. Um, the more you can do to bring less contagion into your home, the easier shot we have of keeping your home germ free. Because if there's only a little bit around, we can nail it. If you've been really sloppy, there's going to be a lot more for us to get. So for us, when we're looking for what we want to disinfect, we want to hit what we call high touch surfaces. These are the objects in the home that consumers tend to touch frequently, just like it sounds, high touch. All right, so what does that look like? That can be anything from doorknobs to cabinet poles to uh, drawer handles to stair rails and chair rails. Um, it can be chair arms, like we were sitting in the top of the giant chair where you pull back. Guess what? You touch it a lot. Um, faucets, the faucet handles. Um, if they have one of those pull down sprayers, you better get that too. Um, appliance handles, uh, toilet flusher. Um, Light switches is an often forgotten one. Counters and tables, big obvious there. And please note, if you can tell your consumer it tends to eat off their coffee table, give it a dis disinfection too. Don't decide just because it's a nice coffee table, you need to ignore it. Uh, quaternary disinfectants should be safe on most polyurethane wood, so you're good to go. Um, appliance buttons, um, dishwasher, microwave, all those little buttons on different equipment around their house, make sure you hit them. And, of course, technology. So this is a tricky topic. Most technology, there's a risk of getting water into the appliance or remote or whatever it is, and you don't want to short out somebody's stuff. I get it. But we need to make sure they're healthy, too. My best advice is spray your towel with your disinfectant Give it a gentle rub to make sure you're getting everything as clean as you can first. Um, we want to get all the dirt and germs off because, again, people tend to be really terrible about eating and watching nightly shows and touching their remotes, and they're all gross and covered in food and bits. And um, so get it as clean as you can. Then in terms of dampening it, the trick I have found that seems to work the best for me is I will dampen my um, microfiber towel heavily with my disinfectant and turn the appliance, whether it's a remote control, et cetera, upside down and block, 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 block that surface to get it good and damp gently. What I'm trying to do is get that, those buttons wet without pressing water past the seams of the button into the electronics. If I have it facing upright, 
gravity is going to work against me and pull those uh, soap down into the buttons and mechanics. If I have it upside down and blah, 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 I am much more likely to be able to get that surface good and damp without getting water into the electronics. Um, the customer smartphone is probably with them, so you can't do much about that. Um, and a lot of touch screens have rules about what you can and can't use on them. So that's going to be for the consumer to handle on their own, unfortunately. But as much technology as you can wipe down, um, you know, remote controls, et cetera, do try to address it. Um, and remind your consumer that if they find out that their uh, computer screen, et cetera, can be cleaned with a disinfectant, uh, they should let you know, and that way you can take care of it for them as part of your routine. Disclaimer. In the last slide, I didn't tell you to disinfect the toilet, tub, shower, and sink, because in professional cleaning, that's a given. It's like saying water's wet. The point of that slide was to list the stuff you might have forgot, not the basics like toilets, tubs, showers, and sinks. There, I said it. Now let's get back to the presentation. All right, we're in the home stretch, I promise everybody. We're now gonna talk about how to protect against cross-contamination. And as a professional cleaner, this is one of the most important sections. Uh, we owe it to our consumers, regardless of whether it's coronavirus or it's anything else, whether it's the common cold. We don't wanna be bringing germs from house to house, so we need to know how to get it right. Cross-contamination 101. Cross-contamination is when you take germs from someplace you didn't want them in the first place and bring them to someplace even worse. In this case, from a bathroom to the kitchen where we cook. Oh no. Um, Cross-contamination can mean from room to room. It can also mean from property to property if we don't do our jobs right as professionals. And frankly, we're tradesmen. We're professionals and tradesmen, forgive me. I wanna forget men, male residential cleaners are a definite part of the industry. Um, we owe it to our consumers to handle ourselves like the tradespeople we are and do it right. So what does that look like? Cross-contamination management per clean. Within each clean, there's a couple rules of what we wanna do. First, we wanna color code our supplies so we are not using supplies in one room and bringing them to another. For example, we don't wanna take a bathroom towel and start rubbing the kitchen counter with it. No good. So you want different colors for different types of rooms. In the case of Maypro, we have dark blue for kitchen, white for bathroom, light blue for living areas, so that we aren't taking those bathroom germs in places they don't belong. You wanna have one set of towels per home, freshly laundered. Um, if you haven't been packing up your towels this way before, get doing it. Um, what that's gonna look like is get yourself some laundry cinch bags. I don't care what you get, um, but figure out how many uh, towels you tend to use per clean. Uh, give yourself a little extra so you're not running out and tie them up and bag them up per home, freshly laundered, so you know that only this home is being used with these towels and there's no germs from anywhere else coming in. Next, you wanna make sure that you're properly laundering those dirty towels as soon as they're done from that clean. Um, that means mo on most machines, there's a towel setting that's gonna use higher heat and uh, higher heat dry and hotter water, and you're gonna to wanna to use quality detergent and bleach in the wash cycle to make sure that you are uh, eliminating as much dirt, germs, and contagion from that uh, uh, laundry product as possible. Um, note that if you properly wash towels in the um, hot towel setting with bleach, you are removing dirt, germ, and viruses. So you are good to go. So those are perfectly uh, safe, sanitary, and ready to go for the next home. And finally, any tools that do need to be used from home to home, hard tools like scrub brushes, et cetera, need to be thoroughly washed at the end of the clean and sprayed down with disinfectant. Um, this is a critical step, again, to make sure that uh, the germs that are in any home, regardless of whatever's going on with the common flu, we want those to stay at the home they're in. So at, at the end of any clean, take those hard tools that um, are being used repeated uh, and make sure you're thoroughly washing them in the customer sink and spraying them down with your um, disinfectant before you put them away and then they'll have a good 15, 20 minute plus soak and disinfectant between one clean and the next. And that way you know you're good to go for the next clean. Now let's talk about cross-contamination management per day. Um, that's the stuff we're doing at the clean itself, but there's a whole day routine you have to worry about. First, make sure you're disinfecting the rest of your stuff. If you've got a binder where your work orders are kept, make sure that's being wiped at least once a day. 
Um, make sure that your caddy that you're carrying your cleaning supplies in is getting wiped down with a disinfectant at least once a day. Um, make sure that um, anything you're touching frequently is getting a good wipe down. Um, and again, damp enough to disinfect. Um, make sure whatever office you're working at. Um, if you're independent, that means taking care of your home. If you're a professional like myself at Maypro, that means taking care of the Maypro office that you're working at. Uh, making sure that in, once in the morning and once at night, the, ho the whole office is getting a good, thorough, high touch area wiped down with the proper disinfectant. Um, that means doorknobs, that means desks, that means drop holes, the same list we talked about before. Um, should be done in the morning and the afternoon. So again, that our pros are sure that they are uh, coming into a clean environment. And also, we're watching for our pros' health. Um, we are trained and know, at least at MayPro, that you know, we offer sick leave, we take care of our pros in terms of making sure they're allowed to leave work um, and if they aren't feeling well for any virus or illness. Um, and so if people are under the weather, they need to call out. Um, and uh, same thing with our independent consumers watching and, and independent cleaners watching this. If you're not sure what you've got right now, everyone's gonna be in a heightened state of awareness. Your coworkers, your customers, and you are gonna feel nervous when you see other people having the sniffles, even if it's not coronavirus at all, it's just a common cold. We're all in a heightened state of alert right now. So for our sake of our customer stress and our coworker stress, this is not the time to show up to work with a cold. Okay, you heard it from me, um, be smart. Um, make sure your office is taking care of all these things so our consumers can continue to feel confident that we have their best interest at heart. Um, your car is another place that needs to be well cared for. Um, just like I said, Purell before you get into, into it, once a day at least, wipe it down with disinfectants on the steering wheel, the gear shift, all the places that you're touching frequently. Um, again, to ensure that as much as possible, we're keeping ourselves healthy so we can keep our customers healthy and continue to help them fight this virus. And that gets back to taking care of yourself. Um, wash your hands properly, not just when you're on the job. Get some sleep, get some exercise, eat right. Um, we want to make sure our immune systems are ready to go for any illness we're fighting, regardless whether it's uh, a new novel uh, strain or it's the good old fashioned uh, you know, cruise ship illness. Um, we always need to make sure that we are keeping ourselves in our best health to help the community properly. So some final thoughts. COVID-19 is new, but proper cleaning is timeless. This is stuff we all should have been doing anyway. Most of this is made for standard practice. Actually, pretty much all of it is. It's just we're doubling down to make sure we remember to do it. It's easy to get complacent when your houses look beautiful and clean and we've been doing it forever and you've been a cleaner for years. This is time to take it as sort of a gentle shot across the bow and say, oh yeah, I should have been doing this anyway. I'm a tradesman, I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. Let me do this right. And uh, let it stay with you long after COVID-19 becomes a managed issue. The gold standard is not going to change. Proper hygiene before putting on gloves, wearing gloves all clean long, not touching your eyes, isn't going away even if we do find a vaccine for this illness. Um, these things are not changing, they are the gold standard. So use this as a chance to uh, find the lemonade out of your lemons here and make it make you a better cleaner. And finally, the thing I wanna leave everyone with, you're the hero in this story. Your consumers are counting on you. Your consumers are actually ahead of the game for, versus most of their neighbors because they've got a professional coming into their property, looking at their property in a way that they won't remember to. You know the high touch item list now. You know how disinfectants properly work. You're the one in the best position to help them stay healthy through this whole process. So go out there, battle ready, and do what you can to help your local community. And last but never least, keep calm and love a research scientist. I am so grateful to all the resources I was able to tap to build this presentation today, um, and to the CDC and all the doctors and uh, nurses working tirely, and scientists tirelessly working right now to help us get this thing under control. Help is on the way. I believe in smart people. I believe they will help us. But till then, let's get out there and do battle and help keep this thing at bay. Thank you for joining the class. After this, there's going to be a brief exam to help you see if you remembered what you learned. Um, if you need a service to take care of you, MAPRO is always here. 
If you're another independent cleaner and want to work for a company that takes care of you and teaches you proper training, we're here to help. Um, and we'd love to help you and have you join our family. Thank you for watching and get out there and let's go battle those germs.